Thanks for having me. If you'll excuse me, I've made some uh, aesthetic primes with this uh, slide deck. It's from mid journey generations. But um, yeah, I'm interested in. Oh, yeah, sure. A USB sock. I'm I'm interested in the claim which has been floating around recently. Um, that machine learning as used in science is uh, a theoretical, and therefore that it's going to somehow uh, disrupt um, scientific practice or else entail some sort of major change in the absolute outputs of science. Um, so background motivation, um, ML is not too new, it's used in science, it's not too new. Deep learning is new, deep learning, especially newer deep learning architectures are new and they're doing genuinely interesting things. But um, I think what's particularly new is that there's now suddenly uh, in the popular consciousness an incredible amount of attention on machine learning. Um, and for this reason, there's a lot of misrepresentation of how machine learning works, of what it's capable of doing, um, and therefore misrepresentation of how machine learning works in science, um, so to speak. Um, I'm interested in claims that I uh, have reconstructed from a uh, philosophy of science literature engaging with these ideas, in particular um, a claim that I have uh, perceived in one way or another in, in many places in philosophy of science literature engaging with the use of ML in science, that um, the use of ML in science is somehow going to disrupt scientific practice or, um, or the episode, outputs of science call that disruption claim. Um, and in, in many instances of this disruption claim, it in turn rests on this distinctness claim, this claim that there's something special about the epistemic status of machine learning tools or deep learning tools, right? That makes them different from normal science or normal math and science or normal applied math or whatever, normal statistical modeling. Um, so this claim of distinctness um, the typical format for this is claiming that machine learning tools or, or deep learning tools, especially unsupervised deep learning tools, are somehow um, free of or radically independent from theoretical considerations in a way that you don't see in normal science or normal modeling in science. Um, so I take, I take, um, the idea that ML is atheoretical to be a denial of the claim that it's theory laden, that it's theory involving in the sense of essentially resting on um, fundamentally incorporating prior conceptualization of the target system or um, domain knowledge of the phenomenon under study. Um, and then these disruption, distinctness, and atheoristicity claims. Um, I'm, I'm primarily, as a philosopher of science, I'm primarily uh, talking how these claims are coming out in uh, this growing philosophy of science, the, uh, Phil Psy, ML for Psy literature, um, but it's also coming from scientists, engineers, journalists, um, etc. And I think to some degree, the, the Phil Psy literature is echoing these claims as they come from scientists that actually understand the maybe popular sources. Um, so just to prove that it's not just uh, it's not just popular science writers and philosophers hallucinating these ideas, scientists are actually uh, making such claims too. Um, and both uh, both optimistically and pessimistically, right? Um, so um, field programmable gate arrays, as they're used um, for solving collision events at CERN, or how they're, they're this is a perspective use of field programmable gate arrays. But the idea is that you've got these uh, like processes, you, you've got these computer chips that are sort of uh, uh, instantiating a model, a, a deep learning model um, in, in the hardware, right? In order to instantaneously be able to sort out uh, 
collision. So, so, so when you're when you're running collision events, you're you're trying to run you know like millions of collision events, um, and you want to look at the particle collisions that are interesting and preserve those for later evaluation, and the ones that are not interesting, you want to discard those. But this is they're proposing sort of embedding deep learning networks into these gate arrays, uh, gate arrays in order to um, flag anomalous uh, events, right? Um, so anomaly hunting. Um, the idea is um, that there is some theory-driven top-down approach that is kind of limiting our scope of where we're looking and by incorporating these new methods, these new theoretical methods of uh, hunting for interesting collision events, we're able to route around those sort of prior epistemic limitations. Um, but uh, it risks yielding diminishing returns when the theoretical picture is uncertain, right? Um, however, we could break down the limits of human creativity in theory building with these methods. Um, similarly, uh, in cognitive neuroscience, um, there's this sense that we've had this kind of theory-driven top-down approach that has been limiting the scope of where we're looking and what we're looking at. Um, and so there have been recent proposals um, from E.G. Daniel um, or Paul Drecknell, um for using the data analytic approaches or ML approaches to structure function mapping from um, neuroimaging data, which is, again, it's supposed to route around the sort of epistemic limits we've imposed on ourselves by relying too heavily on existing theory. Um, however, De Bergard and Gessel, this is uh, in alignment with what I'll be arguing here, De Bergard and Gessel counter um, that the bottom-up approach is uh, runs into problems and rather a diligent piecemeal approach with better theory. It's not, it's not, it's not that we need to be going atheoretical, right, with our science, but rather better theorizing is what we should be aiming for. Um, requiring a conceptual clarity in advance um, about what the right sort of categories are to which brain data ought to be interpreted. Um, and then in terms of uh, what philosophers of science have argued, uh, for instance, uh, Thurin here has argued um, uh, that's in a paper that I think probably already <laughs> that deep learning models are um, at least idiosyncratically uh, instrumental and uniquely opaque. Um, and that in classical modeling or classical computer simulation, you begin with a kind of um, conceptualization of the target phenomenon of interest, which is a step that's absent in use of ML and science. Um, and therefore, this lack of conceptualization of the target system, this lack of theoretical content, um, can, at least in principle, um, result in science that fails to provide understanding or explanation. Um, and this is, in particular, proposed to be the case for these unsupervised deep learning techniques in exploratory research contexts. Um, so therefore, uh, ML deep learning methods um, then have the potential to profoundly change the face of science. Um, again, it's uh, loosely this disruption claim of uh, changing the face of science rests on this distinctness claim about the epistemic status of ML or at least DL systems, um, which uh, relies to some extent on their atheoretical nature. Um, similarly, in the same um, edited volume, uh, Stretskovic um, by Ron Filipovic uh, argued mm -hmm. that in contrast to explanatory focused statistical models, ML models reach predictions about the theoretical backup that supplements the correlations found in the data with potential causal interpretation. Um, ML is theory agnostic in the sense that there are no a priori assumptions concerning the mechanism of the target phenomenon, um, et cetera. Uh, the purpose of these models is predictive um, and isn't involving theoretical assumptions. Um, but, and this is this is this uh, uh, automating science volume that's um, 
Yeah. Uh, good point. Um, so Mika Boone, in that, uh, in in her chapter, that's a con contribution that I did volume, um, argues that um, ML can't replace the role of human epistemic agents in science. Um, but which is a thesis, of course, that I uh, wholeheartedly agree with and endorse here, but uh, along the way, she seems to suggest that uh, proper science can't involve the use of ML because, because it's a theoretical, right? Um, so she writes, in machine learning, the focus is on the data model and how to test whether it is adequate, therefore, from a machine learning perspective, Someone may now ask, why bother about the theory? Machine learning technology can generate adequate data models based on data. We do not need the theory any longer. Um, therefore, machines do not produce scientific knowledge, as in traditional scientific practices. Um, if it were possible to obtain the data models from the nice. If it were possible to obtain the data models from machines, they'd be useless for epistemic uses by humans, as these data models do not meet relevant pragmatic criteria to enable such uses. Um, therefore, real science and machine learning technologies operate in very different domains and must not be regarded as competing. I, I take that to be implying that we can't do science with machine learning <clears throat> um, because of its atheism, right? Um, now, I think that there are a number of reasons why uh, ML or, or any scientific modeling can't be a theoretical in these senses. Um, in the first place, uh, I take the theory-mediated measurement argument. I think data necessarily has to be inflected by theory. Why? Because, um, as Bob and Woodward have argued, data is not a physical phenomenon. Um, Rather, it's an abstraction. Um, it's something that can play an evidential role in science. But similar to scientific models, um, the way we conceptualize them in the model based still side literature, um, data is already a mathematical representation of the phenomenon. It's not the phenomenon itself, right? Um, and therefore, because it's a mathematical representation, um, the relation to the phenomenon the data represents is mediated by a human epistemic agent interpreting it, construing it, to represent that target. Um, so theory infection of data comes in um, in the place of experimental design, um, in how we built and calibrated our instruments of measurements, um, in the kinds of analytic methods we use, um, how we choose to discard outliers, and so on and so forth. Um, and now, today, most philosophers of science view data as theory laden, but um, or, or at least expli explicitly endorse such a view. But um as Sabine Leonelli has pointed out Sabine Leonelli is, is like the uh, foremost philosopher of, of data as a subject in its own right, right? And and the, the sort of roles that data plays in science and the kinds of trajectories it goes on in, in, in going from different data collectors and curators and researchers making inferences from it. Um, and as she argues, although philosophers of science tend to, across the board now, endorse this theory-mediated view of data, um, there is a, a kind of holdout, an implicit view of data as, as kind of objective, right? Um, in the sense of not being theoretically inflected. Um, now, I think, the argument that ML isn't uh, theoretical also must come from uh, the way machine learning has to work in science. Um, so in the first place, ML is a, a big category of virtual um, mm -hmm. maybe more so than is traditionally acknowledged by a philosophical engagement with these issues. Um, there's a huge amount of overlap with classical statistics. So, so any any kind of claim uh, that ML is distinct from classical statistics has to, to sort of come to bear with the fact that uh, that there's a tremendous amount of overlap in these two tools. You know, just think about regression. You know, that's you're you're doing the same thing just with uh, automation or with with software involvement, right? Um, 
ML involves such diverse things as such diverse methods as regression, clustering, dimensionality reduction, decision trees, uh, autoencoders, convolutional networks, transformers, uh, these generative transformers that we've now seen take over uh, image generation and text generation and so on and so forth. Um, and potential use cases for ML and science are almost as diverse as potential use cases for any kind of math and science, right? Um, including uh, ML is used for image processing and enhancements um, or, or any kind of data processing enhancements, curve fitting, um, anomaly detection, uh, like physics informed uh, neural networks for, for solving, uh, for finding approximate solutions to partial differential equations, for instance, um, materials discovery, uh, drug discovery, etc. Um, now, with unsupervised learning, um, there's this question of so, so, so supervised learning, right? It's easy to see how how any instance of supervised learning is inherently theory inflected because what you're learning, what you're predicting, is is just a human label, right? It's it's what label the human has imbued the data set with. Um, with unsupervised learning, um, you might question whether this is more uh, free from theoretical consideration in, in the respect that, that you're not predicting directly a label. Yes, it is, but the data is still uh, embodying the concepts that uh, were involved in its in the in the conception of the measurement process in the first place, and the measurements taking place, and in, in how you built those instruments, and how you process the data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, deep learning again. Um, so, so deep learning, um, in some respects, has been touted as obviating the need for domain expertise and the need for much um, feature engineering. And certainly it gets away from, to some degree, the need for um, careful tinkering of, of the concepts it's learning. But I argue it's still, any, any application in science is still necessarily theory-laden. Um, so I'm going to look at the case of AlphaFold. Um, now we're probably sick of hearing, or, or by the end of the day tomorrow, we'll be sick of hearing. Uh, so um, the protein folding problem is notoriously really hard. Um, predicting uh, predicting amino acid sequences from uh, genetic data is really easy. Predicting um, how those amino acid sequences then form secondary and tertiary and even quaternary structure is then really difficult. Um, you've got all these ways that these molecules can be interacting with each other and bonding together and interacting in, in three-dimensional space um, that it gives you kind of a, a combinatorial explosion here of, of how these things could emerge. Um, and so it's it's long sort of stumped uh, biologists figuring out how to solve this problem, how to be able to predict how these proteins will fold, and therefore how they'll function. Because the function of a protein depends directly on on its shape. Um, in what's uh, AlphaFold two point This was a tremendous breakthrough for deep learning, especially. Um, this is a, a, a transformer-based model. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail. There. I have a I have a sort of longer explanation of the protein folding problem and um, and how uh, AlphaFold 2.0 is able to handle it in the paper version of this, which is preprinted. If you guys want to read in more detail, but um, the idea is uh, your your so so for this they they built their own data set. They built their own the largest data set matching up um, amino, amino acids, known amino acid sequences with um, with folded protein structure that has ever existed. It was an amalgamated data set. They built their own kind of bespoke representations for this. And then they uh, do this process of combining the representations into all these new representational formats. And then they treat it like a kind of graphical problem um, and they feed it back through like a 
specific number of times through the, the sort of transformer trunk of this thing, um, and then ultimately in a one shot predict out the generative um, proposed 3D structure, right? Or whatever. Um, now, even going beyond uh, how they, so I mean, in the first place, the way the way they've tailored the data set, the way John Crypto have, have tailored the data set, uh, involves a lot of work. The way they've tailored the representational format of the data itself, because it's they've they've come up with a new way of, of representing this data in the form of uh, what they're calling pair predictions, which is a pair between uh, templates and uh, MSAs, um, is, is special to this learning procedure. Um, the way they've structured the network is special to this learning procedure. Um, but also even how they specify, for instance, the loss. So this is like a supplementary material, which is, I believe it's like 76 pages or something. It's it's incredibly long, the supplementary material for um the, the like technical stuff that goes along with the jumper little paper, um, which introduced uh, a uh, but if you notice for instance, even in specifying the loss function um and uh auxiliary extension heads, they've got things like um like side chain and back prone torsion angle loss, right? That's not that's a, a frame aligned Point error, chiral properties, etc. So, so they they're defining the loss function. They're defining uh, the success parameters for how these models are learning, specific to highly specific features of the phenomenon they're trying to understand, namely the uh, uh, structure of proteins. Right. Um, so this is undeniably, I think, in 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 every respect, a, a, a very conceptually laden procedure. And it, it's a beautiful success. It's a beautiful win for deep learning and science, right? Um, I want to look to some not so bin uh, uses of ML in science. So um, these are two groups of scientists and philosophers um, who have looked at the use of I'm just picking on dimensionality reduction because there's some really flagrant misuses of dimensionality reduction uh, in science around today that that caught on and became really popular. There were whole uh, there were whole um, like research programs built around um, in the first place um, clustering and dimensionality practices for um, like fMRI data and multi electrode recordings. Um, and then uh, for single cell transcriptomics, there was this whole sort of uh, like cottage industry of, of using um, exploratory clustering and dimensionality reduction techniques um, in order to kind of picture uh, single cell transcriptomics data um, that was pointed out to be absolutely confabulation. <laughs> um, and so for neural feature representation, um, uh, this group, the motivation for applying this, um, these clustering methods um, was in order to view the structure of the data without a bias for a priori defined stimulus classes, right? So again, again it's this, uh, this ideal, this theoretical, um, a theoretical ideal of science, right? Is we're trying to, we're trying to unconstrain ourselves from prior conceptualization of the target system and open up the scope of where we're looking, but in doing so, we end up doing bad science. Um, uh, as Gabriel et al. argue, in these ways, the consequences of treating dimensionality reduction as data-driven hypothesis neutral is that the results can be conferred special status as being untainted by the experimenter's preconceptions. But what they were doing was uh, sort of like Rorschach testing, right? Um, you're able to kind of throw whatever interpretation you want to on the data. Um, again, in single cell transcriptomics, uh, a similar phenomenon arose where there was this whole literature that emerged using these techniques. Um, and they found that uh, they could arrive at the by, right, uh, they could arrive at the same sort of results by throwing arbitrary, like they they threw a flower and and fit 
a drawing of a flower to the data and it had the same degree of predictive efficacy over what they were looking at. Um, similarly, uh, um, the, the <clears throat> elephant figure, uh, from, it's from the elephant? Anyways. Um, could could do the same amount of it, which is it's a, it's a old joke about being able to fit anything to data, but um, they they found that uh, uh, that is Troy and Hacker found that um, researchers were able to kind of use these exploratory visualization techniques to throw whatever interpretation they wanted to onto this data. Um, and notably, this is the case that Florian, for instance, is, is worried about the use of unsupervised learning methods. Unsupervised, well, not deep learning methods, but unsupervised learning methods um, in exploratory research contexts. Um, but I argue such uses are, are when we run into trouble with these uses, it's it's the same sort of thing as running the mill statistical malpractice. Um, and it's this it's this ideal of doing theory-free science that uh, engenders these problems. Um, so takeaways for, for the use of machine learning science, um, I think the narrative that ML is theory-free or that we can do theory-free science with ML um, at best leads to doing things that don't really tell us anything, and at worst, it can mislead us. Um, modeling can't be theory-free, right? When when we convince ourselves that it is theory-free, it's because we're letting theory in the back door, and we're letting ourselves be misled by our intuitions, right? Um, the process of applying ML to real-world data doesn't get off the ground without some keys about the target system, about measurement processes, about the epistemic aims, and so on and so forth. These all come to bear in any use of, of modeling, of any use of ML. Um, and then being able to infer knowledge about some phenomenon in the world from data measured from that system, um, it's a scientific process. It's, it's, it's when we're deploying ML on real world data, we're doing science. Um, and there ought to be some sort of sense of standards of best scientific practice in play with the use of ML on real world data in general. Um, Takeaways for philosophy of science. Um, thesis is the use of ML in science or mathematical modeling in science in general. Necessarily a theoretical exercise? I think yes. Um, I also think that um, maybe there's some sort of methodological uh, things going on here with how philosophers of science tend to engage with science. Um, I think that blanket deference to scientists and science journalists leads us astray. Um, I think, uh, especially in the case of machine learning that's used in science, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's an extreme example because there are, um, there's so much misrepresentation of what ML is and what it's doing. There's so much hype in play around uh, machine learning. So it's an extreme case, but I think in general, um, trusting, Trusting the philosophical intuitions of scientists about their work is is not always the best strategy because they're not they're not philosophers, right? But they're uh, they're not in the business of doing that. Um, and our job as philosophers of science isn't to provide justification for these claims, but to engage critically um, and to get to that kind of critical analysis by deep engagement in scientific practice. Um, I think disambiguating normative descriptive aims um, and engaging with scientific practice is necessary. Um, and I, I think also, uh, I, I think that um, there's been a sort of false dichotomization between like theory driven and data driven science or between uh, theoretical models and, and data models in the philosophical literature that um, is sort of coming out in this uh, literature. And um, this is a paper that I have. Um, I thank a lot of people for the help with the paper and um, including some people in this room helps <laughs> with the formulation of this paper. Uh, references, it's online.